Air Force General Henry Harley Arnold writes in 1941, a nation likely and able to win a war will enter it not only with the largest and most efficient Air Force, but behind that first line will stand the second line. The ability to maintain that superior strength in men and machines. Three years later, the General's prophecy is now reality. On June 15, 1944, the first B-29s fly over mainland Japan. Unlike the Doolittle raid two years prior, this is a mission of epic proportions. That is because Boeing's Super Fortress, the largest plane in the world, is designed for destruction. To grind the Japanese into a pulp. To bring them down to their knees, once and for all. With wings spreading over 140 feet, a fuselage 98 feet long, and four engines each possessing 2,200 horsepower, the Super Fortress is the envy of the entire world. A true symbol of American industrial power. Billions of dollars combined with the blood, sweat, and tears of its creators, make this the most feared aircraft of the Second World War. For it is a weapon that doesn't start wars. It finishes them. For all its accolades and accomplishments, the Super Fortress is America's biggest gamble of the war. A design so complicated, it is the most expensive risk for the United States government. A project that at times seems doomed for failure, and a project that requires a contingency plan. What to do if it never makes it out of the factories? Where to go if the people of Boeing cannot get the job done? This is the secret history behind one of aviation's greatest bombers and how it almost never came to be. The what-if scenarios that America is prepared to take in order to get it off the ground and win the war raging in the Pacific. This is the race for the Super Fortress. Even before America is officially involved in the Second World War, the B-29 is already envisioned. The need for long-range aircraft capable of rendering a decisive blow against any potential enemy is an urgent priority for visionary generals like Hap Arnold. For the next two and a half years, as America remains officially neutral, they are behind the scenes, making extensive plans that include a barrage of new military projects, with a long-range bomber high on the list. Not until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 do the wheels begin to seriously move. In the first few weeks of war, over 350 of the 525 combat planes we had in the Pacific area were destroyed. Over one quarter of our total combat strength was lost. We suddenly found ourselves engaged in a mortal struggle with an enemy who could be counted on for nothing except bitter and fanatic opposition. According to President Roosevelt, uh, the United States was not particularly well prepared um, to engage in the war itself. In 1940, Roosevelt um, called for increased congressional appropriations for military spending, arguing that what the United States needed was to be producing 50,000 planes per year. In 1939, the U.S. produced fewer than 6,000 planes. With the United States at war against both Japan and Germany, bombers are rushed into service. As one old soldier remarked, isn't it sad? During all the years since the First World War, we've had all the time in the world, but no money. Now we have all the money in the world, but no time. In this race against the clock, America comes together. Bombers are wheeled out of assembly lines in order to wreak havoc over Germany. Of notable distinction are Boeing's Flying Fortress and Consolidated's Liberator, where in Europe, with Britain providing a base for operations, American air power is successful due to the short distance from England to Germany. On the other side of the world, the situation is very different. In the Pacific, aircraft with a greater range are needed in order to attack the heart of Japan. It is this geographical requirement that calls for the construction of a design that not only delivers tremendous firepower, but ensures that it reaches its target there and back safely. Operation Matterhorn 
the secret plan to bomb the Japanese from China. Approved by President Roosevelt, it is in these pages that the urgent need for the super fortress is born. The initial requirements simply, as I, as I recall them, were a 5,333-mile 5, range, and I don't know why that odd number, uh, a 2,000-pound bomb load, and I think the speed that they specified was something like 273 miles an hour or something. Those, those were the, uh, the basic requirements. A unique organization, the 20th Air Force is formed, headed personally by Hap Arnold to see over all B-29 operations. All the military needs now is for one company to step up. Unlike the military industrial complex of today, during the 1930s, aviation companies are hesitant to get in bed with the government to make military planes. Companies that uh, could easily be producing military goods, uh, such as aircraft factories, were reluctant to convert their plants for military production because they weren't sure how long hostilities would last. In an era of neutrality acts and cynicism towards any signs of war profiteering, only fixed price contracts are given by the United States. Under these rules, the developer must put forth their own money towards the design with no guarantee of a deal being signed. And with technology becoming more complex, signing on to the B-29 is like playing Russian roulette with your company's future. It is a large risk, one that the giants of aviation are not willing to take. As one Boeing employee said, there was no sound of coin in Uncle Sam's jeans. His pockets only carried marbles and chalk. With most manufacturers losing money during this period, few were willing to step up to the plate. The military production in which uh, U.S. workers were engaged in 1940 and 41 uh, as part of the effort to support the Allied forces helped to pull the United States out of the Depression. Lots of people were back to work, and what that meant was that they had disposable income. Many manufacturing firms did not want to convert to military production because they were eager to take advantage of that consumer dollar that was now available. Douglas, a rare company to turn a profit during the Great Depression, is avoiding the super bomber project like the plague. After having their arms bent by the government to develop the B-19, they reported losses of more than $2 million. Not wanting to be fooled again, their submission for the contract is nothing more than a slightly modified version of that same bomber. In government circles, there is great concern. If Douglas is only putting forth a minimal effort, it is apparent that they are not interested. Lockheed, another manufacturer, is still a young company and a question mark at best. Boeing, having lost money on the B-17, would have gone bankrupt had the government not bailed them out in 1940. With only 2,000 employees, they, like others, want to stick with what is known and proven instead of venturing out into the uncertain. Surprisingly, they submit their design and it is accepted. Boeing had a tremendous reputation on the basis of the B-17. And when you think about the Pacific now, it would have been uh, uh, impossible for B-17s and B-24s to fly, fly those distances in the Pacific. And so the makers of the Flying Fortress begin the project in haste, starting work on a plane that is built before it is even designed. You would always like to build a prototype airplane and fly it and work the bugs out before you commit production uh, of the airplane. In this case, the Air Corps made it known at the very onset of the program that they were going to buy production quantities of airplanes before the prototype ever flew. Certain sections of the aircraft are constructed before detailed designs of other parts are even sketched out. They begin a long and painful journey to build one of the greatest airplanes ever. Boeing decides that the B-29's central nervous system is to be based in America's heartland, Wichita, Kansas. A small city of just 120,000 people is chosen as the site 
where the super fortress is to be built. Why Wichita specifically? There are a couple of reasons for this. If you look at a map of the United States, you'll see that Wichita is just about in the dead center of the country. Also, unlike some other cities in the state, like Kansas City, Wichita had a very tiny proportion of foreign-born uh, residents. Uh, some government officials were concerned uh, that immigrant um, workers would be more inclined to participate in labor agitation, might be more inclined to come from a socialist or communist tradition, or in some cases might um, be allied with Nazism. Hundreds of miles away from America's vulnerable coasts and a farming population familiar with machinery requiring less money to live on, Wichita is ideal for Boeing. Expansion is a necessity, and the city is eager to accommodate both the government and Boeing during the war years. The Great Plains region uh, mobilized to lobby to bring industry to their area. Uh, the state of Kansas uh, organized an industrial development commission in 1939, and in fact, the governor of Kansas went to Washington, D.C. to lobby on behalf of his state, arguing that um, Kansas was safe from invasion, it had lots of natural resources, such as oil, gas, and coal, and it had a large supply of pragmatic farm boys. And so begins an assembly line of epic proportions. A similar system that Henry Ford used to make Model T's in Detroit, Boeing is using to make super fortresses in Wichita. Grandmothers, who never wrestled with anything more intricate than a wood stove up until two years ago, are building super fortresses at Wichita. What is true at Wichita probably applies equally to other major production units of the B-29 program. The super fortress truly can be said to be a product as President Lincoln said, of their government. That is, of, by, and for the American people. Quoted from the New York Times. With a small army of workers, over 60% of the aircraft is fabricated on the spot. Unfortunately, one plant cannot do the job alone. The outsourcing of the B-29's many parts are done in cities such as Marietta, Georgia, Omaha, Nebraska, and the home of Boeing, Renton, Washington. There were something like uh, 764 airplanes on order before the B-29 ever flew. Those airplanes were going to be built by three companies in four plants. Boeing was going to build the airplane in Wichita and Seattle, the Renton plant, uh, Bell in Omaha, and Martin in Marietta, Georgia. So production was committed before the airplane ever flew, and it was a high-risk program recognized as a high-risk program from the very beginning. It is a project coming from every corner of the country, a true testament of America's industrial strength during the Second World War. As the B-29 is constructed, one notices that it is not revolutionary, but evolutionary. A true sign of the times, with militaries thinking bigger is truly better. At the beginning of American war production, the average aircraft weight is estimated to be just over 3,000 pounds. Four years later, that average is shot up to over 10,000 pounds. With this plane's massive size and potential, it comes as no shock that its supporters are eager to get up in the air as soon as possible. Although the enthusiasm for the B-29 is strong, the call for a plane of this magnitude is easier said than done. Being twice the size of the B-17 and requiring double the horsepower, completing it is no easy task. It was a big jump from, let's say, the B-17 for people who were in the 17 that went to the 29, and it was one very big jump for us who went from the B-25 to the B-29. It was monstrous. You had tremendous power in four engines uh, 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 compared to the B-17. And I flew the B-29 up to 40,000 feet, whereas uh, the B-17 would barely go to 30,000. Before being put into production, 10,000 drawings are sketched of a prototype, 
costing the government over $3 million. With it needing to be rushed only adds to its growing list of future problems. Its main flaw is its complexity. With a need to fly at extremely high altitudes, a pressurized cabin is desired, so its crew are not required to wear masks in the air. It was the first pressurized airplane, one that I'd ever flown. I think it was the first thing after the B-17, the B-24 that came along that had a pressurized cockpit, which made uh, flying at altitude far more comfortable than uh, unpressurized, of course. You kept your uh, oxygen mask handy just in case you lost your pressurization. But uh, it was very comfortable. It was a big relief, much easing of strenuous activity on the part of the whole crew. Also, with four extremely powerful engines and over 60,000 different pieces needed to assemble just one plane, this project is turning into one giant jigsaw puzzle. So the airplane that uh, got submitted had grown from an 85,000 pound airplane to something around 110 or 111,000 pounds. In addition, an enormous amount of material needed. 27,000 pounds of aluminum, 5,000 pounds of rubber, 10 miles of wiring, over 1,000 pounds of copper and brass, and nearly two miles of tubing are needed to make this monster. To some, this is becoming a case of the United States biting off more than it can chew. Despite the best efforts of its designers, engineers, and workers, the B-29 is encountering numerous problems. For a population of 120,000, putting together a 120,000-pound super fortress is a massive undertaking due to its workforce's relative inexperience. Recruited from the ranches and farms of the Great Plains, these men, and now women, have not been properly trained for a task of this magnitude. What normally takes years to learn, they must master in just months. While in flight, as is the case with Lockheed's Constellation, overheating is becoming the norm. Some of the engine problems that were there were things like uh, overheating of the engines, Early on, we had problems, uh, uh, again, with propellers that uh, uh, would overspeed, uh, wouldn't govern properly, wouldn't feather properly. Uh, we had problems with the carburetors. The engines would backfire. During one test flight, a B-29 crashes, killing the entire crew, including Eddie Allen, Boeing's chief test pilot. Despite these deaths and setbacks, the project must continue. For America's top generals, the B-29 is becoming a race against the clock. With air bases being built in China, the expected arrival of the super fortresses is scheduled for April of 1944. I understand because of an agreement between Roosevelt and Chiang Kai-shek that these airplanes were going to be in China a year before they were. So the, the rush would get them out of the country. The crew at Boeing, however, is nowhere near completion. Despite this harsh reality, one man, General Hap Arnold, does not throw in the towel. Writing to fellow General Curtis LeMay, he proclaims, The B-29 project is important to me because I am convinced that it is vital to the future of the Army Air Forces. More concerning are the project's economic costs. By the end of development, testing, and production, the government is estimated to have spent over $3 billion on the Super Fortress, a third more than what is spent on developing the atomic bomb. For these generals, it is not only militarily vital that the B-29 succeed. Financially, if the model fails, billions will be lost. Well, when I got to Wichita, I found out they weren't flying them because the Boeing Company had taken this, this position that the airplane was no good and they weren't going to make them. I understand, second-hand or third, that General Arnold told Boeing officials, you're going to build that airplane or give us back $50 million if we've already advanced for the ports being. They thought real quick. They said, well, we'll build the airplane, but we won't take any responsibility for it. 
Arnold has reported to have said, you don't have to take it. The Army Air Corps will take that responsibility. These ongoing problems become crystal clear in March of 1944. Hap Arnold, on an inspection mission, asks how many are ready for shipment to India. Due to the complications in its design, he is shocked when Boeing's answer is zero. It is for this reason there lies an insurance policy, a backup, a contingency plan in case Boeing fails. And for this possible savior, the American government goes to the other three giants of aviation, companies that designed their own version of the Super Fortress. The B-30, 31, and 32 can hopefully come to the rescue if all else fails. At least, that is what the government hopes. Lockheed, with their B-30, represents only a token effort. Many are unsure if they can carry through on a project of this magnitude. The plan to make their super fortress a gigantic bomber version of the Constellation goes nowhere. Their main priority is given to the Connie, which makes it up into the air nearly a year and a half before the B-29 does. The situation is identical at Douglas. Their B-31 design never sees the light of day. Of its three competitors, only one gets a plane up in the sky. Consolidated, makers of the B-24 Liberator. They, like Boeing, are commissioned to evolve their design with the B-32, known as the Dominator. Weighing 50 tons, possessing a speed of over 300 miles per hour, and containing four 2200 horsepower engines, the aircraft appears to be a carbon copy of the Super Fortress. The B-32 was an outgrowth of the B-24, like the B-29 was an outgrowth of the B-17. And just like the B-29, the Dominator suffers from the same tactical problems. The program is almost cancelled in December of 1944, due to development being severely behind schedule. By the end of the war, only a handful of B-32s fly over the Pacific conducting mainly reconnaissance missions. The B-32, uh, I had one there at bomber test. I flew it. It, uh, it had no distinctive uh, advantage over the B-29. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I, I, had to, I had to order my test pilots to fly it. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't much care about flying it. The key advantage for Boeing is its will and determination. With countless man and woman hours put into this project, combined with billions of dollars in funding, they are determined to complete it no matter what the cost. Being so far along with its development, they must see it through. The aircraft plants in Wichita adopted suggestion systems where workers could offer suggestions for how to improve efficiency and productivity and actually get cash awards. Uh, if their ideas were selected by management and then implemented. Uh, many of the amenities that employers offered to workers, like cafeterias, in some cases childcare centers, and so forth, were specifically designed to improve productivity and decrease absenteeism rates. War production is the foundation of our war effort. And by the same token, what you do from day to day affects your country's success in this war. Never forget, you are working for him, for the youth of America, for the boy next door. On the last day of the last war, thousands of such boys were killed. If the war had ended 24 hours earlier, they would have returned. What you do tomorrow, today, in the next hour, and help to bring the last day of this war closer and to save lives that would otherwise be lost. We are all in this together. You and I, your own boy, and the boy next door. Our job is not finished. Let's finish the job together. With a gun to their heads, the people of Kansas come together and begin rolling super fortress after super fortress off the assembly line. In the essence of uh, wartime conditions, you overcame uh, absolutely any obstacles. 
uh, it may have it may have uh, taken only one tenth the time that it would uh, take to solve a technical problem in peacetime. But uh, under wartime conditions, you know, if you can't uh, if if you can't solve it with ten engineers, get a hundred, and and that's what the contractor did. When Arnold, in a fit of rage, demands that 175 B-29s be on time for delivery, this almost impossible task is miraculously accomplished by the people at Boeing, Wichita. Working around the clock for four straight weeks, 600 workers meet this goal. Compared to a grand total of just four in August of 1943, by February of 1945, Boeing Wichita produces 100 B-29s per month. With 20,000 man-hours, these workers are able to produce 4.2 super fortresses a day. A shining example of both their patriotism and dedication. Until the end of the war, production is right on target. On June 5, 1944, from an Indian airbase, the first B-29s take to the sky. It has been a strenuous journey, as the aircraft has traveled more than half the world to reach its target. Ten days later, under the 20th Bomber Command, headed by Hap Arnold, 47 superfortresses depart from Chengchu, China, and begin bombing Japan mercilessly. For the next year, the B-29 becomes the primary tool of destruction in the Pacific. With the Japanese already in a weakened state, they simply could not compete with this advanced super bomber. Things only get worse as the Americans capture the Mariana Islands. With a shorter range to Tokyo, these strategic outposts do nothing but accelerate B-29 activity over the land of the rising sun. Day after day, Japan is bombed into submission. Led by General Curtis LeMay, his strategy of bomb them and burn them is proving effective. Cities the size of New York, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh are being decimated. LeMay even remarks that by mid-1945, they are going to run out of targets to bomb. That dilemma is solved on August 6, 1945. A B-29, the Enola Gay, flies over Hiroshima, Japan. Carrying an atomic bomb on board, the order to go nuclear is given by President Harry Truman. The effect of this new weapon forever changes the way wars can now be fought. The results are devastating. An estimated 80,000 people are killed from the first atomic bomb. I had seen the city perfectly visible as a place where a lot of humans were moving about. You could see it. You could see movement. But when I flew back by it and I was out to co-pilot's window, and I looked at it and look, all I saw was something that reminded me of a boiling pot of tar. Three days later, another superfortress, Boxcar, drops a second atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki, killing tens of thousands more. These two attacks, in addition to the Soviet Union's declaration of war against Japan, finally causes this once proud nation to surrender unconditionally. Aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, on Sunday, September the 2nd, 1945, the most horrible war in history came to its complete and formal end. Foreign Minister Shigemitsu signed for Japan. Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander. The B-29 with its years of development and construction, proves its worth to the American military. For it is truly the bomber that made the difference. It's my personal opinion, and, and I'm sure I'll found detractors, that the B-29 won the war, uh, World War II, in the Pacific. Oh, I think without a doubt, when you consider particularly the uh, Pacific War, it was a key point in winning it. And so the people of Wichita, the people of Marietta, the people of Omaha, and the dozens of other towns and cities that contributed to its production go back to their regular lives. Boeing, 
with no more orders from the government, lays off 70,000 workers at the end of the war. The service they have done for their country, however, does not go unnoticed. I think historians would argue that um, war production in the United States was pivotal, if not decisive, uh, in the war effort overall. Uh, the United States, over the course of the war, spent more than $50 billion on lend-lease aid uh, to the Allies. By 1944, U.S. factories were producing a ship a day and a plane every five minutes. But that's a phenomenal amount of production. In the B-29's history, the men and women in these plants are just as important as Hap Arnold, Curtis LeMay, and those piloted in the aircraft. It's a joint effort of everyone. The maintenance, the supply, everyone contributed to it. For a three-year period, of the over 3,000 super fortresses built, 1,600 of them come out of Wichita alone. On August 29th, in a statement to Boeing employees, General Arnold proclaims, Thanks to what you did, our combat crews had been trained and B-29s were ready and waiting to occupy Iwo Jima. Saipan, and Okinawa, as each base was prepared to receive them. You were given a job to do, and the way you finished that job met our greatest expectations. For myself, and on behalf of the Army Air Forces, I say to you, well done, and thanks from the bottom of my heart. The Super Fortress should be remembered as the greatest roll of the dice in American aviation history in an era where aircraft manufacturers had little to gain with costly military projects. It is amazing that it was able to get into the skies as quickly and efficiently as it did. The race for the Super Fortress is also truly an American story. Its industrial capacity and strength, a supply line uninterrupted from bombings and destruction, and a diligent and patriotic workforce is what made the B-29 possible. of just such an eruption of the earth a million or more years ago was born Japan, land of the little people who grew to believe that in blood and iron lay the shortcut to greatness. Land of philosophies and religions stranger than their names, like Bushido, the medieval code of slicing a victim with a samurai sword. The truth of that one they were to discover Old Japan was primitive. The history of the new Japan is a story of successful copying. On a tradition of peace and love of the soil, the new Japan suddenly turned its back and copied our locomotives, our planes, our great ocean-going liners. Even Tokyo might have been transplanted bodily from the Western world. Japan's plans for world conquest were financed by the fine thread of an industrious caterpillar woven into silk and stamped Made in Japan for its English-speaking customers. Soft silk sent away for hard scrap iron to be forged into weapons and returned to us eventually in hate. How 
will it end for the little people who wanted to enslave the world? The answer to that was to come, like the answer to all things, from the skies. Only when it came, it was to be stamped, made in America. As it was, for instance, on Doolittle Day, when the Hornet, the first Shangri-La, pointed her prow right at the heart of Tokyo. This was the first brief answer to Japan that came from the skies. It was not to be the last. General Doolittle vowed, We're going back to Tokyo, and we shall go in full array and with mighty allies. A weapon was ready. Through these forbidding doors, ceaselessly, day and night, come trains bearing the materials that skill weld, forge, and rivet into an instrument dedicated to the destruction of the enemy. This is only one of many plants that one day appeared where just the day before, it seemed, was pasture land, or the place where they were building washing machines. When the workers reported for the first time, few of them guessed the exact nature of what they were building. They knew that a giant plane would result, but beyond that, it was largely conjecture. But then the day came, inevitably, when the pieces of their jigsaw began to fit together. The day when the mountains of material and the millions of man-hours all combined to confirm the assembly line rumor, the washroom gossip, and their honest-to-God American curiosity. They were building the mightiest aircraft in history. They were building a plane for the Army Air Forces that would reduce the huge fortresses and liberators to medium bombers. They were building the Boeing-designed B-29 Super Fortress. And this is how they built it. Enough aluminum is stored here to lay a silver carpet over every street in Tokyo. Aluminum sheet to be brought to life by these machines and the workers who operate them. They give it shape and personality. Their stamping machines, their presses, lathes and drills, coax it and pound it and pierce it into the multiple patterns prescribed in 50 tons of blueprints. It was bauxite a month ago, dead in the ground. Miners dug it out of the Arkansas hills. And then in some distant factory, bauxite came in at one end and aluminum sheet rolled out the other. One day from now, in the stratosphere above the clouds, it will mirror the sun. In a month, out of the ground and into the sky. These will be the wings to take it there. From the confusion of manpower and equipment within this massive jig will emerge the fabulous 117, a wing of completely new design, which will carry more weight, faster and higher than any other wing. The jigs themselves, the fixtures and the tools were designed so that unskilled workers could be expert with them in a week, whether they were farmers or clerks, cotton pickers or housewives, salesmen or ex-soldiers. The wing is of awesome weight and dimension, yet a girl can lift it with about the same effort that she would need to adjust the flower in her hair. Space and the handling of bulky parts have always been problems in assembly production. The engineers who designed this plant solved both problems at once with a few strokes on their drafting boards. They moved traffic to the ceiling. Thus, they allowed workers more time at machines and machines more time at work. Here is the wing in a more advanced stage. If the workers imagined for a moment that they were in a shipyard, it would be understandable. The Mayflower was shorter from stem to stern than each of these wings from tip to tip. All the pilgrims who landed at Plymouth Rock could curl up within the gasoline compartments in the wing and sleep no less comfortably than on their long Atlantic crossing. 
Each of these nacelles will encase an engine of 2,200 horsepower. Four of them harnessed to one super fortress. 8,800 horsepower. What does that mean? Horsepower means more than 300 miles an hour. Horsepower means flying high enough to see all the New England states at once. Horsepower means victory in the air. When these skeleton nose sections are enclosed in aluminum and glass, they will be the most comfortable cockpits a bomber ever had. The windows cannot cloud or frost. The pilot's instrument panel is less complex than the dashboard of an automobile. Soundproofing allows talk without the interphone. And because the entire compartment is a pressurized tank, the air remains practically constant from prairie level to the rarefied atmosphere over the Himalayas. Back of the control cabin is the huge center section. Here the wings will be set. Here the bomb bays will hold the greatest weight of death ever lifted into the skies. Toward the tail, another big pressurized chamber will house the rest of the crew, except the rear gunner who has a cabin to himself. If in some stratospheric emergency, a crew member must travel between front and rear pressurized compartments, he can slither through this connecting tunnel. An armor glass observation blister. Durable, crystal clear, eyes of every super fortress. Prefabricated sub-assemblies are manufactured by other contractors and shipped to this plant by the carload. What has been shown here is being duplicated in plants all across the country. Identical miracles of modern machinery, nursed and tended and made productive by people who look and think like these people. The fair, the dark, people with deft hands, and unblinking eyes, the strong with their willing muscles, and those less strong but as willing, the braided schoolgirls, the white-haired grandmothers, the old young, the young old, the little ones, and the less little ones, working together in intimate harmony, their product, death, their goal, peace. These workers are the lucky ones who see the finished product of their labor roll off the line. Every hour of every day, they are witness to this awe-inspiring ceremony, this tremendous wedding of material and man hours, this climax in the history of man's conquest of the air. What of the others who helped, however remotely, to create an aerial weapon they have never seen? The lumberjack who felled the trees that became the blueprints of the B-29. The bauxite miner in the Arkansas hills, and the miner of iron and coal. The builder of guns and engines and propellers. The grimy, sweating men who cast the cylinders and forged the crankshaft. The maker of tires, electrical equipment, instruments and safety wires, the citizens who paid for the super fortress with their purchases of war bonds. Theirs are isolated lines of effort, initiated all across the land and converging eventually beneath this vaulted roof. Here, the sum of their energies assumes shape and stature and meaning. Here is the final meeting of every effort and every part. A bold insignia will proclaim to the enemy that this is the proud new weapon of the United States Army Air Forces. But it is our plane too, because we the people built it. We conceived it, financed it, gave it wings. We powered it and armed it, and our sons and brothers fly it. 
The function of the people's super fortress is to break the race who turn their backs on reason, to spin them around to face the peaceful way of living. It is the people's answer to all the sneak raids, all the death marches, all the stabs in the back. It is our memorial to the fighting men who were not afraid to die, who bought with their lives the time we needed to make the weapons to win the war. Like this weapon, which 50 hours after its tests will be landing in India or China or some other far away Shangri-La to regain its breath before the final assault for which the people destined it. Within the plant, work proceeds, but the workers cock their ears for a sound that regularly drowns the clatter of their tools. It is more than a sound, it is a song. This is the song they hear. The story begins in 1939, when the far-sighted Army Air Forces said, we want a plane for our defense that can fly a bomb load thousands of miles out to sea and return. After six months' work, there was a tiny model which spent the next six months in a wind tunnel. And then there was a full-scale model which was subjected to every punishment man could devise for it. Only after a year of such tests, did the Air Forces let contracts for planes that would be built to fight. The B-25 Mitchell is a big strapping bomber, 67 feet across the wings, but it could reach Japan only if it took off from an aircraft carrier. Much bigger is the famed B-17 Fortress. 104 feet from wingtip to wingtip, it has ranged 1,400 miles over Japan's island conquest but it cannot reach Japan itself from any base we now hold. The Super Fortress, wingspan 141 feet, longer than the Wright's first flight through the air at Kitty Hawk. Range, altitude, and bomb load, secret. Though the Air Forces do say of them laconically, very long, very high, and very large. Because it is a global bomber, around it has been built an entire new air force, the 20th. The 20th War Theater is the world itself. Its operations room is the war room of the chiefs of staff in Washington. Its planes will be treated as a major task force in the same manner as a naval task force is directed against a specific objective. Watch it come in for a landing a revolutionary set of flaps that constitutes nearly one-fifth of the wing area gives the ship a low landing speed and a shorter landing run than many a plane half its size. All this great weight of super fortress is supported by a tricycle gear whose tires require less pressure than a child's bicycle. Somewhere in western China, half a million nameless people wrote their magnificent chapter in the saga of the super fortress. Two thousand years after their ancestors built the Great Wall for the defense of China, these farmers transformed saturated rice paddies into airfields for offense against a new invader. They had no machinery as we know it, only their million hands 
and a searing memory of anguished years since Japan set out to annihilate them. And soon there were runways to bear the weight of a whole fleet of super fortresses. Revenge for the nameless people was close at hand. Even in China, land of miracles, the arrival of the Super Fortress is an occasion for everyone to turn out in curiosity and in welcome. A welcome now, but journey's end on the other side of the globe is only the beginning of another, grimmer journey. The tanks will have to be filled, the engines given a final check, the guns armed, the bombs set in the racks, and then briefing. And the assembled airmen will listen to words that a few years ago would have been fantastic, but today roll casually off a briefing officer's lips. The target, gentlemen, is Japan. This is it. This is the B-29, the plane you've been waiting for. And it was worth waiting for. It's the biggest, fastest, mightiest heavy bomber in the world. It can travel farther and higher than anything else on wings. It has a pressurized cabin, permitting high altitude flight without oxygen masks. It has five remotely controlled, electrically driven turrets, each carrying twin 50s with a 20 millimeter cannon added to the turret in the tail. Yes, the B-29 is everything you've been promised. And the pilot who flies one has an enviable job. Important, glamorous, and tough. Here's a B-29 pilot. He's measuring the distance between pin centers on the left landing gear. This part of the job isn't so glamorous. But it's the pilot's responsibility to make sure that everything on this biggest bomber in the world works properly. If you were a B-29 pilot, here's exactly what you'd have to do before an operational flight. Check the nose wheel. See that the tires are inflated to 45 to 50 pounds per square inch. While measuring the pressure, look over the tires for general condition also. Watch out especially for cuts or signs of serious wear. One of the ground crew will replace the dust covers, but you're still responsible for his work. After you've measured the pressure in both tires, give the gear a visual check. The strut should be clean, with a clearance between pin centers of 10 inches. And the shimmy damper must be full. That's important. Make sure the rod is almost up to the notch in the gauge on the shimmy damper reservoir. Now you can look over the engine cowlings on your way to the other main landing wheel. This gets the same inspection you've already given its mate. The co-pilot ducks into the wheel well to inspect the equipment there, while you work on the wheels. Measure tire pressures again. On these tires, the pressure should be between 75 and 85 pounds per square inch. Inside the wheel well, the co-pilot examines the wires, connections, and switches. He makes sure all the cannon plugs are on tight, paying particular attention to the plugs on this motor, which opens and closes the nacelle doors and also to the plugs of the normal and emergency landing gear motors. Then he turns around to examine his side of the strut. He looks it over and inspects the brake lines, making sure that the hose is not chafing and no fluid is leaking. Meanwhile, you're checking the clearance between pin centers again. 13 and one quarter inches, right. Now, are the wheel chocks in place? One behind the inboard tire and one in front of the outboard tire, just as it should be. Next, check the cowlings, inspection doors, and inspection plates. You've already examined some of them, but you must be sure all of them are okay. The other members of the crew help you out with these inspections. Here, for example, a gunner tests the fastening of the top cowling. 
But you'll have to check the security of the other coverings. And there are a lot of them all over the ship. While you're walking along, you can examine the wing seams. Fluid leaking from them means trouble. Now to check the ailerons and trim tabs. All control surfaces and all trim tabs must be inspected. Test the tabs for excessive hinge play by shaking them. And see that the gas tank caps are tightened. If there were extra fuel tanks in the bomb bays, their connections would have to be examined. But now the pilot and the co-pilot continue their tour around the plane. They have a lot to check. Hatches, windows, control surfaces, trim tabs, inspection plates and doors. But the pilot and co-pilot aren't the only crew members with inspections to make. The gunners, for example, besides helping the pilot check the airplane, must also be sure the guns and gun cameras will work properly. They must inspect all five turrets in the same way they're now examining this lower rear turret. After they have the dome and gun cover removed, they see that the ammunition moves freely in the chutes and is correctly loaded. The guns just don't fire with the cartridges in backwards. They also check the safety wiring on the gun mounting bolts, up in there. Then the gun charging switches are put on reset. That conserves the CO2 pressure, which automatically charges the guns. Finally, the gun camera is inspected. Enough film, speed set at 16 frames per second, lens adjusted to the brightness of the day, and the interval control put at the desired number of seconds and turned on. And this turret is all right. The dome and gun cover can be replaced. The tail turret is checked by the tail gunner. But again, the pilot is responsible. If the guns fail, he gets the blame. So he watches the tail gunner as the Shatterall feed mechanism is inspected. Now the other gunners only have to lock the latches. Elevation latch locked. Azimuth latch locked. The doors are shut and fastened. And the gunners can go to another turret. And there's still more work to be done. Each engine must be pulled through 15 blades, with only two men per blade. The engineer takes care of that. He sits at his position, making sure that all switches are off, while the four engines are pulled through. And now the co-pilot puts on his clothing and collects his equipment before joining the rest of the crew for inspection. Notice that the crew members wear fatigues while making their inspections and change into flight clothing only when they are ready to enter the plane. The examination of the exterior of the airplane is completed. So the crew can fall in for the check of their personal equipment. That's the last item of the before entering the airplane part of the procedure. And it's strictly the pilot's job. Your job. You are responsible for the men as well as the plane. If they fail, you're at fault. Each crew member must have his electrically heated flying clothing, parachute, oxygen mask, knife, a quart of water, and May West. Steel helmets and flak vests are already inside the ship at the positions. Apparently, these men are completely equipped. But don't think they only have to climb into the ship and fly away. There's a lot yet to be done. Let's go along with the pilot again and see what he has to do to take a B-29 into the air. He climbs in through the hatch in the nose wheel well. That entrance is also used by the co-pilot, engineer, navigator, radio operator, and bombardier. There's work for every man before the engines are started, during engine starting and warm-up, before takeoff, after takeoff, and then a whole list of additional things to do before landing again. As soon as the radio operator gets in, he climbs back to close the pressure door between the forward compartment and the forward bomb bay. The bombardier is the last one in, so he closes the hatch. The gunners close the pressure doors in their compartment. They also open the cabin pressure valves which will now automatically maintain the cabin pressure at the desired level. Three compartments in the plane, the pilot's compartment, the gun control compartment, and the tail gunner's compartment, are sealed off from the rest of the fuselage and supplied with this compressed air. The cabin pressurizer keeps 8,000 feet altitude inside the plane until the outside is at 30,000 feet. If the plane gets higher than 30,000 feet, the pressure inside drops off gradually but it is always 13.4 inches of mercury more than the outside pressure. But let's get back to flight procedure. The gunners take care of the other pressure door in their compartment. But what about the pilot? That's you. You already have your chute fastened, 
your May West on and the seat adjusted. So you put your throat microphone and earphones on. If you put the mic on first, you won't get so badly tangled in the wires. Don't forget to plug in your disconnector cord. Now to start work. Ask the engineer for forms 1, 1A, and 01-1-40, and look them over. Be sure that everything on forms 1 and 1A has been checked. Pay particular attention to the list of defective equipment. If anything vital is out of order, it must be fixed before taking off. The weight and balance computation is in form 01-1-40. That's important. Make sure it's correct. When you've examined all the forms and signed them, you can give them back to the engineer and tell him to start the putt-putt. You have to turn on the emergency ignition switch. The tail gunner looks after the putt-putt, starting and stopping it on orders from the engineer. But now, you set the jackbox selector switch to command and turn on the proper command receiver and the command transmitter. This puts you in communication with the control tower. Now examine your own equipment. Look over your oxygen mask and make sure your portable oxygen bottle is fully charged. Then try out the cockpit lights. To test the ultraviolet lamps, turn on the switches and twist the shutter. You should then be able to see the light. By turning the shutter back, you can control the amount of ultraviolet light emitted. Next, try out the alarm bell. The gun commander will tell you if it's working. Then depress the brake pedals and pull out the parking brake knob to set the brakes. Look over to the control stand and make sure that the emergency releases and switches are correctly set. Power transfer switch, emergency landing gear release, emergency bomb release, emergency cabin air pressure release, and pilot's over control. Now unlock the control surfaces and throttles by moving the locking lever on the aisle stand full forward. Then release the throttle brake and test all four throttles through their entire range. Take it easy. Move them slowly and gently. All controls on the B-29 should be handled in this careful manner in order to prevent damage to the mechanism. There's no need to push hard. And the co-pilot doesn't just sit and read the checklist. He must test the action of the control surfaces, moving each surface, elevators, ailerons, and rudder through the complete range. The gun commander looks from his blister, observing the response of the surfaces, and reports to the co-pilot. A similar test is made on the trim tabs. The co-pilot turns the three control wheels as far as they will go in each direction. That big wheel on the side of his control stand operates the elevator tabs. The aileron and rudder wheels are on top of the control stand behind the throttles. The way the trim tabs follow the setting of the control wheels is also observed by the gun commander, who tells the co-pilot over the interphone how the tabs move. The co-pilot turns the tabs back to neutral after testing them. And now to try out the wing flaps. But first he calls the side gunners on the interphone to make sure none of the service crew will be in the way of the descending flaps. When the gunners report that it's safe to go ahead, the co-pilot presses the flap switch to the down position and holds it there until the flaps have been lowered 15 degrees. 15 degrees is enough to tell if they're working all right. The co-pilot can't see the flaps, of course, so he watches the wing flap position indicator. But the gunners can check visually. They tell the co-pilot if the flaps come down all right. So now he can bring them back up. The gunners, again, will tell him when they're up. Don't start thinking the gunners have nothing to do but watch control surfaces and flaps. They have their own checklists to follow. The right side gunner, for example, is looking over his supply of spare lamps and fuses. Yep, that's okay. But now you, the pilot, are almost ready to start the engines. See that the automatic pilot master switch is off. Check over the four sets of control surface adjustment knobs, making sure all their pointers are up. Then set the manifold pressure selector to the zero position. And depress all four propeller RPM switches to the increase position and hold them there until the lights on the co-pilot's instrument panel flash. Now you're all ready to start the engines, and the rest of the crew should be too. They check in with the co-pilot, reporting in this sequence. Bombardier, who sits directly ahead of the pilot and co-pilot. Navigator, who is some distance behind the pilot, facing forward. 
flight engineer who is directly behind the co-pilot facing aft, radio operator who sits across from the navigator and faces the right wall, gun commander who is in the top of the fuselage amidships and can face in any direction, left gunner who faces aft, right gunner who also faces aft, and the tail gunner who stays close to the putt-putt during takeoff and landing. His combat position, of course, is in the tail. Everybody's set now. Warn the service crew outside you're going to start the engines and tell the engineer to start number one. And number one engine spins twice. And now he turns the fuel boost pump on, closes all the throttles except number one, sets the fire extinguisher to number one engine, presses the starter switch to energize, and then flips it to start. And finally turns the magneto switch to both. You have to push the throttle to 1200 RPM and signal for number two. The same procedure is repeated until all four engines are running. Now that the engines are going, vacuum pressure is available to operate your gyro flight instruments. So the gyro compass and the flight indicator can be uncaged and set. The co-pilot will be doing the same with his gyro instruments. Next, see if the other vacuum pump is working all right. Have the engineer switch to the pump on the number two engine. The vacuum may drop some, but it should go back to about four inches. Now you can call the control tower on the command radio. It's already on. This is about the right time to get your taxiing instructions, since you'll soon be ready to move out to the runway. At the same time, ask for the field barometric pressure so you can adjust the altimeter. It must be set carefully to the correct pressure. In this case, 29.84 inches. Obviously, an accurate altimeter is a vital necessity, especially if you may have to fly on instruments. Next, you want the bombardier. You know he sits back with the navigator and the radio operator until the ship is in the air. But right now, he has to come forward to make the final checks on the bomb site. He's already completed the regular pre-flight inspection of his equipment. All he must do now is see that the bomb site is entirely ready for takeoff. The directional clutch should be disengaged and the secondary clutch engaged by turning it clockwise. Then the drum wheel must be turned counterclockwise as far as it will go. That does it. He's all set to take off. And now you're ready to close the bomb bay doors. Ask the ground crew outside if there are any obstructions underneath the plane. Everything's clear, so you can order the bombardier to close the bomb bay doors. He throws the door switch while you look back through the pressure door to watch them shut. The rear bomb bay door is looked after by one of the gunners, who will tell you when it's closed. When both doors are shut, the bombardier can go back to his takeoff position in the rear of the compartment. And you're almost ready to taxi. But you'd better make one last check of the turret warning lights. Uh-oh, that lower rear turret light is on. Call one of the side gunners and have him take care of it. Perhaps the turret wasn't stowed. Forget about it, gunner? Well, it's easy to fix. Get control of the turret, press the action switch, and stow it. That does it. There, that turret warning light is off now. And everybody's set. Switch your jack box back to command and signal the ground crew outside to remove the wheel chocks and get a safe distance away from the airplane. The co-pilot warns the crew to stand by to taxi. And you can release the brakes and move the ship out to the runway. While taxiing, or whenever the plane is moving, all crew members watch from the windows and keep the pilot informed of obstructions. The gunners can provide the most help since the blisters give them a wide view. This is a big airplane. It's mighty easy to hit a fuel truck or another ship and clip off part of the wing or stabilizer. And that doesn't help the flying characteristics a bit. Notice the flaps are kept in the up position. If you taxi with them down, the undersurfaces are likely to be damaged by pebbles blown back by the propellers. After you've stopped at the edge of the runway, put in your call to the control tower for permission to taxi on the runway. When the tower has given the clearance, move on the runway. 
Steer with the outboard engines, not the brakes. Excessive use of the brakes on a plane as heavy as this one will wear them out quickly. As the ship is turned around at the far end of the runway, notice again how the engines are used for steering. You can see the right propellers moving faster than the left. When you're at right angles to the runway, stop for the engine run-up. Tell the flight engineer to get ready to make his magneto check while you run the engines up, one at a time. First, press the propeller RPM switches to the increased position, holding them there until all the propellers are at maximum RPM. Next, turn the manifold pressure selector to position eight. With the knob in this position, the superchargers automatically provide military power. Now advance the number one throttle, but slowly and gently, to 2,000 RPM. Hold this speed until the engineer tells you the magneto check is finished. Then press the propeller RPM switch to the decrease position until the tachometer drops about 200 RPM. Now flip the switch to the increase position and hold it there until the light on the co-pilot's instrument panel flashes. And then push the throttle to full open. The tachometer should show about 2600 RPM for the number one engine, while manifold pressure should be around 47 inches. To see if the turbo is working properly, turn the manifold pressure selector towards zero. That should make the manifold pressure drop. The turbo's okay. Bring the throttle back to idling, around 550 to 600 RPM, and increase speed to 1200 to avoid fouling the spark plugs. Next, start on the number two engine. The same procedure is repeated for each engine. Now you're about set to take off. After you're cleared for takeoff, turn the plane the rest of the way around so that it points down the runway. and stop again while the co-pilot lowers the wing flaps about 25 degrees. He can tell when they're right by looking at the wing flap position indicator. And the gunners can check on the accuracy of the indicator by watching the flaps from their blisters. They report on the approximate flap position over the interphone. When the co-pilot tells you the flaps are okay, fasten your safety belt and set the manifold pressure selector to position eight. Next, set the propeller RPM switches to increase RPM and wait for the lights on the co-pilot instrument panel to flash. Then warn the engineer to be ready for takeoff. Stand by for takeoff. Now you push on the brakes, hard, and open the throttle slowly until the manifold pressure gauge reads about 40 inches. Then release the brakes. As you gather speed, slowly advance the throttles to full power and set the throttle brake. Manifold pressure should go up to 47 or 47.5 inches. RPM should go up to 2600. Continue accelerating down the runway until the indicated airspeed gets up to 95 miles per hour. Then slowly pull the control column back, putting the ship in a flying attitude. The plane takes off without further action on your part when it gets flying speed. The exact speed at which it will leave the ground depends on the weight. When the ship is airborne, apply the brakes to stop the wheels and then have the co-pilot retract the landing gear. He has to hold the landing gear retracting switch in the up position because the switch is spring loaded. The co-pilot makes sure the nose gear is up by looking through the inspection door on the floor of the cockpit just ahead of the aisle stand. The wheel is there, all right. At 160 miles per hour and 500 feet altitude, the co-pilot retracts the flaps, snapping the switch on and off until the indicator shows that the flaps are all the way up. The side gunners should be watching from their blisters as the plane takes off. They tell the co-pilot when the flaps and landing gear are up. Now you ought to change from takeoff power setting to climbing. 
Adjust the manifold pressure selector until the manifold pressure drops to 43 inches. And decrease propeller RPM to bring the tachometers to 2400. You can order the engineer to have the putt-putt turned off now and tell the bombardier to come forward and take his combat position in the nose of the ship. If this is an operational flight and enemy opposition is expected, have the men put on their flak vests. These vests are made of small overlapping links of tough steel sewn inside canvas. Quilting on the inside of the canvas provides further protection and also cushions the shock of impact. Above 10,000 feet, oxygen masks must be worn by one man in each compartment. When you reach the desired altitude, level off and tell the engineer to set up cruising conditions. First, you move the throttles back to about 65% of full power. Individual manipulation of the throttles may be necessary to keep each engine at the same manifold pressure. Now you adjust the propellers and manifold pressure, so turn the controls over to the co-pilot. Start with the props. Press the propeller RPM switches to decrease and bring all four propellers to 2,000 RPM. Then turn the manifold pressure selector down until the manifold pressure drops to 30 inches. The needles should stay together in this case. There you are, 30 inches. Considerable juggling of throttles, propellers, and supercharger may be necessary before you get it just right. But that's how you get a B-29 into the air. It's a big, heavy, and powerful airplane. Bigger, heavier, and more powerful than anything you've ever flown. For that reason, it must be handled gently and precisely. You must carefully follow the prescribed procedures. Even a super bomber is no good to the Army if it's in little busted up pieces. But don't get jittery. The 29 is a sweet ship to handle. When it stalls, the nose drops so that the plane automatically recovers. There is no tendency to spin. Stalling speed varies quite a bit naturally depending on weight and other conditions, but generally it's between 84 and 135 miles per hour. When turning or executing any maneuver, take it easy. This is a big plane, remember, not a fighter. Yet fairly steep turns can be made safely. This 30 degree bank can also be done with full flaps. That's about the limit. And when evasive action is necessary, you have plenty of tricks to pull. Just watch this B-29. And the B-29 does more than just fly well. It packs a terrific wallop, a wallop enemy fighters will quickly learn to fear. That turret you see moving is only one of the five on the ship, which mounts a total of 10 machine guns and one cannon. Four of the turrets, two on top and two beneath the fuselage, can turn through 360 degrees in azimuth, 90 degrees in elevation. The tail turret is more restricted in movement, but it has a 20 millimeter cannon in addition to the twin 50s the others carry. But the big thing about the 29's armament is the fact that the gunners don't touch the guns. The guns are controlled remotely from special sites, and any gunner can fire almost any turret. For example, one side gunner might have control of two turrets, firing four caliber 50s at his target.
that's only the beginning of the story about guns. So let's get back to what a pilot has to do. Now you're ready to land. Since you've descended below 10,000 feet, remove your oxygen mask. Tell the co-pilot to take over control of the ship so that you can get out of your flak vest. The vest is easy to take off. Just pull on the cord and it drops away. This speed of removal becomes important if you ever have to bail out, since the vest is worn over the parachute and, well, you figure it out. If you've been riding with the automatic pilot, turn it off. You can't use it for landing, of course, or when taking off, flying turbulent weather, or setting trim tabs. The co-pilot should now warn the crew to prepare for landing and tell the bombardier to climb out of his seat in the nose and get in back with the engineer. Then the co-pilot has the engineer start the putt-putt. You check the turret warning lights. All the lights are off. Then call the control tower and get landing instructions. At the same time, ask for the field barometric pressure and set the altimeter to correspond. Now the co-pilot hits the brakes to test the hydraulic pressure. Both normal and emergency systems should have 800 to 1,000 pounds. To find out about the emergency pressure, you have to ask the engineer. At the same time, you can see if he's ready to land and get his log. He has calculated the new weight and center of gravity since you've used up a lot of gasoline by now. You should look the log over, but the co-pilot will check it carefully, examining the center of gravity and weight computations. The table on the instrument panel gives the stalling speed for the computed weight. The co-pilot tells you the stalling speed and also reports that everybody in the crew is ready to land. Next, you adjust the propeller RPM switches. Push them to increase until you get the tachometers to show 2100 RPM. Now adjust the manifold pressure selector to give you plenty of reserve power. Turn it all the way up to position eight, the setting for full military power. When the plane has slowed down to 180 miles per hour or less, order the co-pilot to lower the landing gear. When the switch is set to the down position, the wheels descend all the way, lock, and the gear motors automatically stop. When the left and right gear are down, the side gunners, who should now be watching the wheels and flaps, will report to the co-pilot. He himself can make sure the nose wheel has been lowered all the way by looking through the window in the floor of the cockpit. Next, the flaps should come down. If you've been in combat, the co-pilot should lower them first only five degrees. If they were damaged, lowering them all the way might rip them off the wing. The gunners can look them over and report on their condition. The flaps are all right, so the co-pilot can lower them 25 degrees. Notice that he snaps the switch on and off. That way, the flaps descend gradually, and a sudden change in the lift characteristics of the airplane is avoided. The gunners will report when the flaps appear to be down 25 degrees, and the co-pilot can check by looking at his wing flap position indicator. When he has the flaps where he wants them, he'll tell you. Then you'll probably have to reset the trim tabs because of the change in the flap position. Next, adjust the throttle brake to a comfortable tension. And don't forget to turn off the detonator power switch. Now make a standard approach, keeping the speed about 30 miles per hour above stalling. And on the final approach, Order the co-pilot to lower the flaps all the way. When you touch the ground, the plane should be slightly tail low and going between 95 and 100 miles per hour. Notice how the main wheels bear most of the shock of landing. Then the ship slowly settles forward. Don't apply brakes immediately. Let the plane lose some of its speed rolling. Then turn the manifold pressure selector all the way back to zero. You won't need the turbos anymore. 
and set the propellers at increased RPM. Raise the flaps now while you're taxiing and have plenty of power. You're down now. You followed your checklist step by step. But there are other checklists. The engineers, for example. So suppose we go back over that landing procedure and see how the engineer's checklist fits in with yours. Five minutes before landing, the engineer tells the tail gunner to start the putt-putt. The ship enters the traffic pattern at a 45-degree angle to the downwind leg. Altitude is 2760, speed is 180. Here the co-pilot lowers the wheels. The mixture controls are set to auto-rich, and the cowl flaps open 15 degrees. At the end of the downwind leg, the speed should be about 140 or 150, and at least three generators must be on. The co-pilot lowers the flaps 15 degrees. After the pilot makes the procedure turn, the altitude should be 2260 feet. The co-pilot lowers the flaps to 25 degrees. The pilot sets the manifold pressure selector to position 8 and adjusts the propellers to 2100 RPM. Just before the final turn, the engineer checks the magnetos and turns the boost pumps on. Around the turn, on the final approach, speed should be at least 140, altitude 800 feet. Also, six generators should be on. Finally, the co-pilot lowers the flaps all the way and calls out airspeed and hydraulic pressure as the ship descends to the runway. After the airplane's on the ground, turbos come off and propellers are set to full increase RPM. The engineer switches the boost pumps off and opens the cow flaps all the way. All right, we're back where we were before. Tell the bombardier to come forward and open the bomb bay doors. The doors should always be kept open when the ship is standing still to prevent the accumulation of gas fumes. Next, turn off all the switches. Then you can get rid of some of your equipment that remains inside the ship and climb out for the after-flight inspection. Yes, you start with an inspection and finish with an inspection. If there was anything wrong, now is the time to find out about it. And now is the time to correct it. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.